afternoon, everybody. This is Nora Leo talking again from Oslo. We are very happy and very proud to be able to be in contact with all of you, although it's a little bit technically difficult, of course, to have a more direct communication. We are aware that some that some things might have been unclear last time, much due to difficulties in transmitting the sound. But we do hope that by reading the manual and looking at the presses, you have a relatively good uh, understanding and insight into what we wanted to do. So. This will be the second session of the seven-week um, training made possible by a lot of efforts by Hamsa, which we are extremely grateful. And um, I want to thank him right away. So what we wanted to do last time, and you all responded to this in, in different ways, was to lift the two basic principles of our manual, namely to have a human rights approach combined with humanitarian principles of the SPHERE project as a value basis on our work. Because we are dealing with severe human rights violations that give very severe health and life problems, but we think that it should be based on human rights principles. And the second aspect we underlined was the need to approach this field also with a, with a mental health perspective. So these were, and we asked so some questions, and we hope that you have had the opportunity to discuss it among yourself or even give it a thought. How can a human rights-based approach enrich our work in this field, and what will a mental health perspective give us in addition to our work. You have all sent us some points as to what you expect and what you want us to discuss. I have, um, this was transmitted to us by Hamsa. I have analyzed and looked closely at the points and I think I can say that we will cover most of these during the seven-week session. So I do hope that you find that the main issues have been referred to in one way or another. And today we will deal with session two, which we called call the good helper. So I will invite you to open the pressy and move to page first one and two and then three and then four of the pressy. So if you are there, I will just make some comments on mental health and psychosocial support. But I think before I do that, I will reiterate something I said last time just to emphasize what we think is a possible value of the manual, namely that it can be read as a textbook about what is trauma and traumatic reactions, that is reading the different chapters on the manual on trauma is a way of describing what is trauma and what are the reactions in an alternative textbook form. The manual can also be used as something that you can, that gives you in, uh, inspiration in your daily work with survivors. But we also hope, as a third major point, that the manual can be used as a training manual. So when you, let's say in a month's time, two months' time, want to provide training to your collaborators, to younger people in the field, or less experienced people in the field, 
you can actually use the manual as a text to the training itself. So exercises, instructions, and explanations are all in the manual. So we wanted just to clarify this because we we know that we sometimes use the term helper, sometimes use the word trainer, but this is just to explain the reason why. So if we come back to Pressy number four, we, we underline again the close relationship between mental health and psychosocial support in a context of gender-based violence. And as you see here, we see it we define psychosocial support as the effort to strengthen a society and an individual's ability to meet the psychological and physiological stress of potentially traumatic event. This means that we think that it's in the community, it's important to be aware of ways of dealing with traumatic stress in those who are exposed. Because the experience of gender-based violence can be a very distressing event for a survivor. All survivors should have access to supportive listeners in their families and communities. Additional gender-based violence-focused services should be available. The aim is to enable the individual and the society to return to normal after abnormal events. And the first line of services directed at survivors will often be through community-based organizations, or for instance, different NGOs, etc., in which trained GBV support workers provide case management and resilience-based mental health care. Some survivors may require more specialized mental health care from an expert experienced in addressing GBV-related mental health issues. This was also a question from some of you last time. How does one deal with referrals? This is important, but right now I think we will concentrate on the direct assistance that we give. Before I go on to talk about the helper, I want to underline something which I think may be the case where you are working, and it's certainly a case many different places, namely that women or men will not readily come forward and say that they have been exposed to, 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 um, to sexual violence. It may be something that they prefer not to talk about, but they might want help for their reactions without saying what has actually happened. I'm sure that all of you have experiences both in relation to receiving people who are talking about it and you have experience with people who not, not over their dead body would speak about the violation itself but may want to speak about their problems to sleep, to breathe, to relate, to eat, etc. So what we will try to look into this time is ways of approaching a person without in any way asking him or her to talk. That is, using again the principles, which are very well-intuned principles of human rights and principle of trauma-based um, assistance, namely that you meet a person with very great respect, you give the person room, you do not at all push the person to speak, and you allow the person, him or herself, be in control. We will come back to all of these principles today. So, if you move to question number five, you see again a reference to the inter- Agency Standing Committee Guidelines on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support, another example of a document that is referred to and also referenced in the manual that can be of interest. So the current training, namely this training, can be part of a first step 
in a GBV-focused services provided by volunteers in a community who provide psychosocial care to gender-based violence survivors, even though they may not at any point tell you that that is their trauma. It is often something that one knows. That is why we think that help should be gender-based violence informed, but not necessarily gender-based violence focused in the conversation. I want to stress this difference because I think it applies to many places in the world. Are we doing okay? Are we okay? Hello, I'm going to start. I'm going to go to the circle. Fine. So I will now move to talking about the good helper. This is the term we use, um, and we will try to explain and to engage, first of all, you in the conversation about what is the qualities for a good helper in your community. We all know that we as helpers, that means the, those of us sitting here, it is Hamza where he is, and all of you sitting where you are, are all of you helpers engaged in work with people who have been exposed to severe human rights violations. We are often working in contexts that are very limited in the sense that we do not have a lot of, of care providers, we do not have necessarily any safe places to take people to, we may be working in situations full of limitations and problems. But the most important tool that you will have in this work is yourself. You will be the person who can provide assistance to the person in terms of respect, support, help, some counseling, etc. And your way of helping him or her to understand that they are not crazy, they have not lost their mind, but they are suffering from severe human rights violations is something very, very valuable. So how we tune our own tool, how we develop our own approaches as helpers is tantamount in this context. So we would like to talk with you, but I think that the comments that you will be making um, will be on chat. But I would like to start asking all of you to write down, first of all, on your own piece of paper, two or three points that you think qualify a good helper in your community. What are the qualities that you will define as important in your community, in your working context, of a good helper? What does she and he have to know and be aware of? Shall we do that? So a couple of minutes for all of you to reflect and write down. And then when you have done that, it would be fine if you could write it on the chat and Kristin will tell me as the input comes in and we will also take note of what you're sharing. Can you repeat your question, please, again? Please, Mira. Um, Christine, will, um, Christine will now take note of some of the qualities that the group will define uh, for, for what are qualities of a good helper. What is a good helper in Syria, Egypt, 
or wherever you are sitting, Turkey, what would you lift as major qualities of the helper in working with these problems that we are talking about? I'd like you to write to chat to Christine because I'm I'm um, without machines. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. You can write to all so everybody sees. And we will take notes so we can comment. Mm hmm. Skriver du ned et vært? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think we have some um, some very valuable. I, I see that many of you lift the importance of keeping calm. Uh, you also name being non-judgmental, which is extremely important because as late as today, I spoke with someone who 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 did not want to talk because she considered what had happened to her her own fault. So she was not willing to to present the story in the beginning at least and you have also underlined to be a good listener and to accept the other person's differences to strengthen their inner strengths and survival tools and i see some of you also include same gender as the survivor and that's a very interesting point we will we will raise the question about the gender differences here. Sometimes it's maybe best for women to speak to women, but we can, you can, I'd like you to reflect on, is it always the best for men in your experience to talk to other men? Or will they sometimes feel it's easier to speak with women? Um, I have experienced both and and working on communication skills extremely important and close to or trusted by the survivor mm -hmm. i think all of these are are very good uh, good qualities i will now um Want, uh, I want to invite Kristin to share with you the picture on the next slide. And after we have done that, we will come back to some of your input. Yeah, we will give you some, some more minutes to write down. Yeah. So I think some of the here comes from from Melissa also the importance of knowledge on international human rights principles. I think uh, these are very very important, and also the local laws for gender-based violence. And I assume that this may be related to the differences in different countries as to what is possible and what is not possible. For instance. 
consequences of reporting may be very complicated some places, whereas other places it may open up for protection. It seems to me that most of you have focused very strongly the importance about listening and listening calmly. But we all know it is very easy in a situation that is stressful to become so engaged, we want so much to help, we start moving close to the person and perhaps even a bit agitated. Normally, that's not very wise. And this is something that you're all writing about. So being, and also one point that um, I'm sure it's included in your list, being able to respect the distance in the room also, not pushing yourself onto a person, giving the person the possibility to define the distance between you is, am I sitting too close? Should I move behind? Is it okay like this? Let me know if this is fine with you. And this is a way, as you also underline here, to give the power and the control to the person. And it is very much a part of having good communication skills. We have, uh, just to illustrate some of these points, we have made a little video that you will be seeing afterwards. And um, you will see that we have underlined the, the quietness, the space for the woman, and very much accepting that she can remain silent or talking. We will show this in a while. Thank you very much. We will take all these notes down and we will make them available to you um, in, uh, in, one, in one document. Um, this exercise that we are doing now, looking into the qualities of the helper, is something that we have done in all the different places where we have done the training and used the manual. And it started because when the first time this was being worked with was in Congo. And of course there, there are many, many helpers who are, who are working and meeting with the many women who have been raped as part of the conflict and who are applying for help and seeking refuge in some of the centers, often organized by the community or by NGOs or others. So in one of these trainings, if you now look to the PRESI on page 8, you will see a, a, uh, a helper, and you will see that she has been drawn in quite a particular and peculiar way. But the points here are the results of the group work that the, that the helpers had when they got together. Because they asked themselves, like you have asked yourself and each other, what are the major qualities to be a good helper in this work? And first of all, they underlined, as a helper, you need to have big eyes and you need to notice details in body and mind. This, of course, we can translate into being very attentive and aware of the person that you have in front of you. Being aware of the person being afraid, wanting to withdraw, and use your eyes and your listening skills to understand as much as possible. Also, the Congo helpers underlined that you need to have a small nose to protect you from bad smells. They oftentimes had to wander around in different areas where terrible things had happened and there could easily be, be bad smells. So that was 
one of the things that the helpers mentioned. Also, you see in the drawing, it's a very tiny little mouth. And why? Because the helper shall not talk so much. The helper should not give lectures, <laughs> as I'm doing now. The, the helper shall talk when it is appropriate and let the survivor talk. So if you see the head of the helper, you can see the big, big ears, even huge ears they drew on the helper to allow the helper to carefully listen and to collect information. So being a good listener, which some of you have also included in your list, you underlined being an active listener, and this is, of course, a great value, um, is a very good skill to have as a helper. And again, it's so easy to forget, it's so easy to become eager and talkative, and even a bit pushy, but here we mention, here the Congo women said, no, you must have huge ears to listen carefully and collect information about what you hear and what you see. The helpers also notified that you have to have a big heart to receive the story with empathy and respect. And talking about the heart here is of course a, is of course a metaphor for being able to communicate empathy to be able to show respect and empathy to the person that we are sitting with. If the person that is seeking our assistance feels that you do not want to understand, you are even in some way withdrawing from the communication, they will very easily fall out of the room or out of the, the situation. Also, the Congo helpers underlined a big bladder so you could sit for a long time without having to go to the toilet. This is, of course, more a humoristic one, but it underlines the principle of time, how important it is to, to be available over time given that he or she wants to be there, even being quiet together. And the Congo helpers underline strong legs to walk distances. They often had to walk even in the woods, over the mountains, out in the field to rescue people who had been severely damaged in the war and particularly women who had been raped and who were just left in the woods. So the helper must have the physical condition and the feet to be able to walk which is also a metaphor for strength, of course, physical strength, to be able to deal, to deal with this. Also, they noted big feet that are solid in contact with the ground. That means that you're not up there in the skies. As a helper, you're able to be very much rooted on the ground, carefully situated, listening, and receiving. The Congo helpers underlined a big bag to put her pride and her prejudice. Because even helpers may have some prejudice and perhaps pride, I don't know. Uh, and to put some of these bad thoughts in the bag and keep them in the bag was one of the suggestions by the helpers. And on the top, you can see there's a helmet or a crown, something to protect you both physically and psychologically. As a helper, we may easily become vulnerable. Vulnerable because we are part of the situation which in itself is, is critical and often very risky. But also we, are, we listen to so many stories we hear about so much pain, so we need, symbolically, a helmet, something to protect our thoughts and our minds. If this is not about being an armor or something that separates us from the others. It's about protecting ourselves in a way 
which is first of all something to do with colleagues, protecting ourselves by talking with colleagues about what comes to our mind and when we feel that work is being heavy and claims a lot of us. So as you see, this interesting drawing became a, f a kind of a metaphor also for the helper in Congo. We have seen that, for instance, colleagues in Jordan, colleagues in Cambodia, colleagues in Latin America have drawn the, this image in different ways, stressing different aspects, but a lot of them very, very similar. And we will look again through your input and if not create a drawing, at least make a list of some of those major qualities in a good helper. You may ask, why do we spend time on this? And we can move to number nine. Why do we want to discuss this issue? Yes? And any, at any moment, if you want me to stop or dwell with something, please let me know by chat and Christine immediately informs me. The reason why we focus, uh, focus on the helper is that we know that these are our major tools. It is the helper's tools that you can use in your daily work and we hope to enlarge the repertoire of tools. We, often, we will be talking about the toolbox during the seminar because the toolbox contains many of these abilities and strategies that you will use as a helper. And we will, through some of the exercises that we, are, that we will explain to you starting uh, next time and the, the time after, the grounding exercises, the breathing exercises, to mention some, will be additional tools for you to have. We will also speak about ways of getting control over trauma reminders, that is, all the different memory, all the different stimuli that may evoke trauma memories and very painful moments. We will also deal with tools to train the woman to deal with trauma reminders, and that will be an additional tool in your toolbox just to preempt some of, the, some of the issues that we will be dealing with. In slide nine, you will see that there is about the good helper and a question, what could be the difference between a man, man helper and a woman helper? And we, some of you mentioned same gender helper is the best. Could you take a couple of minutes, all of you, just to think about this in relation to gender? Can we afford to decide on that? Uh, is it always culturally the best appropriate approach? Is it something that we must look into as we meet the individual? If we ask the person, are you okay talking to me? Even I'm a woman, you're a man, you're a woman. Is that the way? Or do you have any input or experiences as to how and why same gender client therapist or alternative or other qualities in men and women could come in as relevant here? I will stop now and if you have some input, you can chat it and we will, as last time, take note of it. Hatte da die Suppe. Ja.
Ja. So, and first, go this a little bit. So, a little bit between ourselves, as you may hear. But we will. Um, I'm sure you have been able to to think about and and even to write some input as to this issue about gender. Oftentimes, we will not have have the options, but of course, we may have as a principle that we will not choose a male helper to a raped woman unless she particularly wants to speak to a male. And sometimes we can be surprised. So so if you have now done given some reflection to this, we would like to move you on to the next next point. You can pass by the the page ten now. And you can come to 11, where you see tools for you to use in your work with Survivor. And as you see already, many of these comments have been made by you already. It's about listening, showing respect, and acknowledging painful reactions. That is saying, I see, I know, I understand that you are in pain. Um, I respect you for the person you are, and I will not push you, um, push you. The next point, communicate that you see her, see in, made in, in, uh, in quotation marks, because we cannot see through the person in any way, and we're not supposed to analyze or to interpret. That's one of the worst things that we may do at this point. But we can communicate that we see the pain, that we understand her suffering, and that you can deal with her in a very direct way, him or her. We will underline creating a safe place for the survivor who is sitting with you. Even if you cannot control the circumstances in total, you can try to create a little safe room where the two of you are and it's safe in an interpersonal way. It is safe because you are there to assist her or to try to assist her. You are there to, to um, create some quality situation with her that she feels safe in. And you, you have to stabilize yourself and indirectly also her with the here and now approach. This means you are dealing with what is happening in the room. But yes, no, this is a good question. We cannot understand her pain in the sense that we know how it is. I think what we should try to communicate is that we understand that she is in pain and that we understand that she um, that she may want some help from us. I think to to try even to try to say that oh I know how it is for you is creating distance. So I think the point you made there is a very very good one. And some helpers are eager to say oh yes I understand because I've spoken to so many others, or yes I understand because I've been there myself. We can never fully grasp the world of the other, what we can grasp is that they are struggling, that they are, that we can understand that they are struggling with their pain. So thank you very much for focusing on this. In the early parts of the conversations, it will be important to be very here and now, to be here in the room with the person establishing communication and we will show you a role play now in a moment. We will also, as I mentioned, focus with exercises that ground the person. 
The video you will be seeing now does not include the grounding exercises. The next ones that you see will, as well as the relaxation and energization with exercises and more psychoeducational approaches. These last three will be tools that we will be dealing with very soon. I would li now like to invite you to see a, um, a little video that we made. It's, it's, not, it's not a perfect video of how things absolutely should be. It's, we have made it ourselves here at the office. But we would like you to take notice of, of, uh, of different aspects of this. Is the therapist able to create some safety? How does she deal with the fact that the woman is not ready to speak? How does she deal with the fact that they're sitting together, closeness, distance, etc.? Um, how does she reflect that she understands that the woman is in pain? And again, does she manage to create some safety and confidence or possible a confidentiality? So if you can just have a look at the, this video and the two actors here are Elizabeth and Kristin and it's taken here in the office where we're sitting. So are you able now to open that little video and I will find Fine. Thank you.
Hello? Hi, we can hear you very well. Yes, hello. Well, as you, um, this was just just to have a, a background for, for, for a discussion on some of these points. Myself, I have commented that I would probably not be so clear to say, yes, I can help you, but I would probably say, um, I will try to help you. I will do as best as I can, but I'm very willing to help you if you want to receive my help. So that's one additional comment, perhaps, that many of you may have looked into as well. Had you, did you have a chance to, to discuss some of these other bullet points that we raised as to pushy, distance, respect, allowing, breathing, room, creating, although limited, some sort of a safety? You can write, you can write things on the, on the chat. On, if you move, for instance, to PC15, you will see discuss what you saw when you, when you saw the video. Or if it's, um, if it's difficult to, to write these things, um, perhaps we can tune you on, unmute you. Because the main, I think some of the main principles that we are looking into here, um, because we all know from, from being helpers that it's, it's easy to be too much on the active helping side and the person may be very frightened um, if you're too much practically demanding to be accepted. And uh, here we have a, an interesting comment. Sometimes the survivor cannot reach you, and you have as a helper to reach them or at least be available near them, which is, is uh, probably, as I understand it, that we oftentimes are moving around. I have myself walked around in, in dwellings or in even tents in different places and spoken to people as I meet them out there where they are. It's not always that we have an office or have a place to sit together. But regardless of where we are, it's a matter of creating a form of communication that respects the other, where we are not telling them to tell me immediately what has happened. If I, if I shall help you, I must know everything. Um, and finding the, the, the context or establishing the frame that makes it possible to create a dialogue. So we will, we will um, address these issues again, but to us at this point, we just wanted to illustrate and remind ourselves of the importance about having an empathic understanding, which is not the same as the content understanding. It's a matter of communicating empathy and being there in the room with the person, respecting his or her limits and his or her ways of telling you. When we, later in the course, present the, the butterfly woman, we give you an idea, another tool, so to speak, that it is possible to speak about a, a metaphor. It's, a, it's possible to speak about someone that has similar reactions and someone which has experienced some of the same things without saying, without having the person say what it is. We will use the story and we will explain to you it in the fifth session when this will be the main part. So if we have now established just some, some first, first, la first round of tools as we talk about them, tools about being 
Yeah. Tools about listening, tools about creating space, tools about not pressing, not asking for what has happened, but presenting yourself as a possible receiver. We can move to the next part of this session number two, which is taking care of yourself as the helper. Is that okay with you now? Can we, can we move to the next session, section of the session? As I mentioned some, some minutes ago, some of the techniques or the tools that we may use to help victims, such as stabilization exercises, sleeping advice, etc., can often be helpful to the helpers themselves. And helpers need to understand that it is important to recognize their own needs and reactions and understand what triggers and modifies them. Again, we're using here the same language as we are when we are talking about those we are helping, and we're using some of this knowledge on ourselves when we feel overwhelmed with feelings and reactions. And in this work, it's not an ambition or an objective to become John Wayne or somebody who is totally not receptive to stress and problems. If we are to be empath emp em show empathy and be present with other persons, we are also vulnerable. We are vulnerable for stress and pressure and we need to deal with it. We need not to close it in and hide it. These are not the things to be put in the bag. These are things to be shared with others. So, if we move to 19, we see the list of the warning signals that can occur after a prolonged period of time on a job, especially on stressful, problematic jobs or works. First of all, one often feels that one has the wounded ideals. One does not one, in, one may, for instance, ask oneself, is this worth it? Is it this that I want to do? Are these the ideals that I once had? This may be a severe sign of stress. Also, to be cynical. Sometimes people may have some sense of humor on their work, and I think that is very healthy. The problem comes if you start to be cynical about what is around you in a way that affects your work. And the question we have to raise ourselves is, are we able to let our colleagues know if we react to their being, they being cynical? Or do we accept that others are telling us that we are becoming cynical? Um, sometimes also one can feel un unappreciated or betrayed by the organization one works with. And this may, not, they, this may not necessarily be a sign of stress. It can be a source of stress because it may be true. It may be true that the organization is not supporting you, but it may also be that it is supporting you, but you interpret it as lack of support and lack of of willingness to, to deal with what you're dealing with, it's, which may again be a sign of stress and definitely something not to be put in the bag, but to be shared with friends and colleagues. The loss of spirit, not having the energy, not having the engagement. You wake up in the morning and you just feel, I have to go because I have to go, but there's no energy you don't perhaps you may even start believing that you're not doing a good job or that you don't even feel you want to do that job. Again, can we discuss it with somebody else? Can we say to somebody, I may need a timeout? Or somebody can say to you, you may need a timeout or do something to work on your own loss of spirit. Sometimes people get grandiose beliefs about their own importance. This may sound a bit strange, 
But sometimes people get very, very, very important. More and important in a way which is not so very sound. It's I have to be there because I'm the only one here that is able to do this. Um, I cannot be away for a second. I cannot afford myself to sleep. I cannot spend time on eating. Uh, I'll have to be there because my role is is so important. Of course, we're all important in our work, but we also need to know that there are limitations to everything, including this. Sometimes helpers tend to be careless. They They start taking chances. They start performing reckless behavior. They may even be heroic, but it may be reckless because we're not armed people. We're not, we are not in any way, neither police nor military. We are helpers. We are care providers. We are very much within the humanitarian frame of the work. We are not, um, our job is to keep to these principles. And it is also a sign that one can start neglecting one's own safety and physical needs. As I mentioned earlier, for other reasons, not needing breaks, not needing sleep, etc. And being, being ne neglecting one's own safety, for instance, reckless driving or any form of activity that may put both yourself and another in danger, may, may very often be signs of stress. And again, are we willing to accept comments from others? And are we willing to share our concern about these things with others? We may start mistrusting colleagues and supervisors. They don't know. Oh, they don't understand. They don't have the knowledge that you have. Sometimes it may be true, but it may also be a sign of stress. You've worked, a lot, you've worked too hard. You have not given yourself any rest, and you start mistrusting people around you. Again, here we have to discriminate between what is mistrust, because perhaps you come underway with the fact that someone is receiving money, that something is wrong, that you should whistle blow about. That is something else, of course, which is also problematic but important. But now I'm talking more about the kind of mistrust that often happens when we're getting too tired, too overwhelmed, too stressed, too identified with what we're doing to be able to see ourselves and our work from a little distance. So we're talking about severe stress reactions. And even moving it to antisocial behavior, antisocial behavior could include also, for instance, um, yeah, that will come to excessive use of of alcohol, drugs, etc. But antisocial behavior can also be forms of violence or aggression, talking very badly, harshly to people who are not <laughs> able to receive it or fight back. So again, it can be signs of extreme stress or excessive tiredness. Some people under stress become very active. Other people under stress become very tired. And you probably know from yourself where you belong. Sometimes we can change also over the years. Inability to concentrate. You will remember from the knowledge about trauma, and we will also discuss trauma in, in the victims or survivors later on. Uh, being being able to uncon to being unable to concentrate being unable to be here and now being unable to deal with one thing at a time is often a sign of post traumatic stress and in some ways we are having we can develop vicarious post traumatic stress that is we tend to develop some of the same reactions than that it's the persons that we are working with. And some, an inability to concentrate, as is hyperactivity or hypoactivity, absolutely an issue to deal with. Sign of stress. 
And then we have the symptoms of illness or disease. We can develop symptoms. We're not necessarily ill or have a disease, but we can dis develop these as signs of stress. Sleep difficulties. There can be inefficiencies in our work. And of course, what is often considered the most problematic way of reacting to stress, namely starting to self-medicate by using alcohol, tobacco, or drugs. All of them unhealthy and not at all conducive to regaining strength and energy in your work, and most of the time also prohibited in working contexts in a very serious way. I'm sure that many of you have already passed different forms of, of security tests or security training. I know myself from the security trainings that I have been through in, in the UN context. So many of these aspects are being discussed because there are signs that makes us into in unsecure and unstable helpers. And in the long run, that's a security issue both for ourselves and for those we are helping. So can you think of any other signs to identify that you are being stressed by your work, that things are too heavy, too much? If there's some other signs that you have known from yourself or others that you would like to include, please include that in, in the chat. Help, helper fatigue or helper. It's. I mean, there, there are different there are different terms for these different things. You can. I think what we've been talking about now is very much a helper fatigue. Um, I also, but I cannot. We can also, when we're talking about traumatic persons and work with trauma victims, which we all are doing, we can also call it. Um, call it the secondary or, or vicarious traumatization. And also, it, it might be loss of spirit, normal, normalization of the abnormal circumstances. Yes, because none of these reactions are abnormal. They are, they are normal stress reactions, so to speak. But when they come to a certain point, um, we know that stress reactions over time may be harmful. And it's not abnormal to react to abnormal situations, on the contrary. That is what we're telling the survivors. Your reactions are sound, your reactions are important, but we know that when they pass over a certain limit, they are not helpful and our, our clients will need assistance and we may sometimes need assistance to redirect and to have a timeout. And indulging, yes, there's also one interesting comment here about indulging oneself in one's own work and denial of work harassment just to reach the results, uh, which is, if I'm not there, they will discriminate the survivor, etc. I think. Many of us may have had that sensation many times, and sometimes it may not be all wrong. We may perhaps be one of the people who are protecting the children, the survivors, etc., and we don't have strong, as strong confidentiality in others. But it may also be a very, it may also create a very problematic working condition. So in such cases, I would try to discuss this with my colleagues, how can we ensure that the services that are given, the care that is given, the protection that is given, remains stable even across the working shifts? Which means that it doesn't mean that protection is off because I am off. So these are, these are absolutely something that are extremely difficult to talk about, may be extremely difficult to talk about, but very important to talk about. 
So some some will call it uh, burnout, some will call it helper fatigue, some will call it um, vicarious traumatization. But when we say vicarious traumatization, that is even further, because this is not only fatigue and irritation and concentration and lack of spirit, people may start having nightmares, a kind of reaction which are very similar to the ones that we're working with. And I'm sure that some of you have experienced nightmares in relation to what you've worked, but if it becomes something more constant, that you feel that you are triggered every day by what, you have, what you're working with, again, it's high time to get some help oneself. Um, I personally, I tend to write, there's a question here about taking notes when the survivor talks. And I usually myself tend to take notes, um, I, I, but I explain. I have a little piece of paper. I show the person the kind of uh, paper or book it is and that I'll write just some notes for my own memory and that these are stored safely without any names unless I'm sitting with medical records and have all the equipment. Um, I usually do that even in situations where I don't have a table. I hold my little notebook to write some notes. But again, if we feel that this is disturbing for our contact with the person, or the person feels disturbed by this, I will try to stick to my, to my memory. So, if we come back to some of the stressful reactions which are absolutely to be expected when we are dealing with difficult thing, things, we have on the press on number 20, there are some suggestions as to what we can do, such as acknowledge that your reactions are normal and unavoidable, that you understand that yes, this is something, this is part of the game, but I must know when it comes and how to deal with them. Also consciously to try to relax. Some people are not so good in relaxing, but they may do other things. Other things than working. Talk to someone with whom you feel at ease. Very important. And we have understood by own experience and also by communicating with others, working in different agencies, that the room for dealing with these reactions in the different agencies, in the different organization, is very, very varied. It's not obvious that people are taken care of or that there is room in the organization to deal with these things. So express your feelings, for instance, in ways other than talking. Draw, paint, play music. Some of us may not have people around with whom we can talk. Are there other ways of expressing feelings? Can we take up drawing even if we haven't done it before? Can we do some painting, big sheets of paintings with lots of color? Or even only black if that's our temper? Play music, exercise, do something which breaks the rhythm. And when we think of, of trauma therapy, Breaking some of the trauma rhythm is perhaps some of the basic points also in trauma therapy that we do with others. Listen to what people close to you say and think about the event. You may want others to say, but did, didn't you react very harshly here? Uh, you, why did you start crying? Uh, how can we understand what happened to you? That is, provided you have colleagues who are willing to help you by communicating to you about their own reactions. Take care of yourself, of course, sounds a bit without any content at all. What is taking care of yourself? But again, this is something that we can reflect upon ourselves and we can speak to others. And lastly, which I hope is something that you will take out of this seminar, it is uh, having grounding exercises, which are a lot of examples in our manual, and we um, we will also do this together with you. But grounding exercises is really just getting back to the ground and to the chair. And now, if you all of you just just to do that for one second, all of you place your two feet on the ground, 
Because when we're talking, when we're thinking and writing, we tend to forget our feet. But if you now just for a moment can feel the weight of your feet toward the ground, it may give you one moment of relaxation or even some feeling of comfort. And in work with people who are full of anxiety, who are full of tension, and I'm thinking now of the survivors primarily, but not necessarily, doing grounding exercise of this very simple kind and some of the others that we will talk about along the line is maybe of great value. And we tend to forget our feet. We tend to forget to ground ourselves in the ground. And it has an amazing effect if we feel anxious. If we feel the heart is pounding, our breath is going on the top, we feel extremely stressed, feeling or regaining contact with our feet on the ground may be just a very good thing to do. So, if we, had, if we were in the same room and if we had lots of time, we would want, of course, to, to um, have you think about and even write things that make you feel that you relax. This is always good for us to have a list. What is it, again, that can make me relax? I mentioned now one easy grounding uh, technique, but there may be other ways. And I'm quite sure that all of us in this room and in your rooms have or at least should have some lists of what is good for us to do when we need to take a time out. It does not mean necessarily that we can leave far away or do something very different. It's about creating a time out in the context in which we're working by doing things that may give us some relaxation. And also, it is a good exercise to think, how do I know by myself that I've had too much too much stress, too much worries? Do you wait till your husband or wife says, you are so stressed, I cannot have even have dinner with you? That's, then it has gone too far. Or if your children say to you, where are you, Dad? Where are your mother? You seem to be far away in your thoughts. Then it's also a sign that we are somewhere we should not be, at least when we're with our family. So, as this will be um, it's exactly 6.30 now. We have gone through many things. I'm very aware of um, the importance of having some, some comments and input or feedback from you. I think these examples we've had today have been very good. But I think that I will end what I have prepared for today at this point. And again, I wish you so much luck in your work and enjoy so much engaging with you. And we will, um, we will listen again to some of your comments. And our next meeting will be in one week, the same time. And the, the theme for next week will be the brain. It will be a lecture on emotions and reactions uh, based on our understanding of brain and Re and survivor reactions. And it is a friend of ours, a colleague of ours, Doris, who is a doctor, who will present in my place next week. But the system, the way of doing it, will be the same. So, questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, let's shall we try to see if we can if we can unmute you and have have your voices if there are questions or comments. So we just spend some minutes uh doing this. Thank you again. Uh, I will open your mic if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, so you can share it with us. Mohammed, mm -hmm. Melissa.
Melissa, did you have a question uh, or a comment? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much. I enjoyed knowing you there. Thank you very much. So so if you if there are comments or ideas that pop up when even after we we close down the technique here, don't hesitate to to write uh, mails to Hamza to and to Elizabeth, uh, and we will um, we will be able to um, to deal with them next time in a little bit in the same way we did today. So I wish you all the best till next time. I will come up come back a little later in the course, but um, again. All the best to you, and um, I hope that um, you are as well as absolutely possible, and that there's some small contributions that you can take home from these lectures. Thank you again for your active and engaged participation. Thank you.